My name is Dr. Zachary Morse. My colleague, Dr. Shaban, and I would like to share with you how we approach the interpretation of a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Having given many lectures over the years on this topic, it is not unusual to see the audience's eyes start to glaze over halfway through as the plethora of data that can be obtained is continuously laid out. Many times I've been approached by physicians expressing their level of discomfort trying to assimilate and correlate the large amount of data that can be obtained during the performance of this test. I'm going to break this presentation down into two parts. Hopefully by showing you our systematic way of examining the data, we can make this an easier task. Because there's so much pulmonary diagnostic information that can be obtained if one knows what to look for, we are going to dedicate part one of this video to just the pulmonary interpretation. It's important to understand that the goal of exercise testing is for the test subject to try to achieve their highest possible effort in oxygen consumption. The Fick equation takes into account all physiologic abnormalities that can alter the body's consumption of O2. This equation states that a person's oxygen consumption is determined by their cardiac output times the difference between their arterial oxygen content and mixed venous O2 content. The cardiac output can be obtained by multiplying the stroke volume times the heart rate. The content of oxygen in arterial blood, or delivery of oxygen to the muscles and organs, can be affected by any lung disease that causes hypoxemia. Very low hemoglobin can also decrease the amount of oxygen delivered to the muscles and organs, as well as diseases such as hemoglobinopathies that can affect the ability of the red cell to carry oxygen. Intracardiac right-to-left shunts can also decrease the O2 delivered to the periphery. And though we do not see these as often as the above, we cannot forget about diseases that can diminish oxygen consumption, such as metabolic disorders or myopathies, that prevent or impair the metabolism of oxygen. Before one can understand what is abnormal, we need to understand what physiologically limits a normal subject. When a healthy person exercises to the level where they feel they are unable to go any further, it is usually due to reaching a cardiac output limitation. Going back to the Fick equation, we showed you the cardiac output is determined by the stroke volume times the heart rate. And we can see why when cardiologists perform cardiac stress tests, they use the maximum predicted heart rate to determine if a patient gave a good effort. When a normal subject reaches their cardiac limit, they will have around 25 to 30 percent of their ventilatory reserve remaining. Having said that, well-trained athletes can keep pushing on when reaching their cardiac limit and when doing so can use up that ventilatory reserve trying to buffer the increasing excessive metabolic lactic acidosis. They can blow their CO2s down into the low 20s or high teens with extremely low pHs in the 7.2 range. Also, fit elderly subjects can use up their ventilatory reserve and reach their ventilatory mechanical limits. Let's now talk about the specific pulmonary physiologic abnormalities that can limit a patient during exercise. We are first going to talk about what we refer to as a pulmonary ventilatory mechanical limitation. Then we will talk about gas exchange abnormalities. And lastly, we will discuss diffusion limitations. A ventilatory mechanical limitation means the patient has reached the limits of their maximum ability to increase their minute ventilation. Calculating a subject's minute ventilation is simply the product of the tidal volume times the respiratory rate. A subject's predicted minute ventilation can be determined by having the patient perform an MVV maneuver during spirometry, or it can be calculated by multiplying the subject FEV1 times 40. For example, if a patient has an FEV1 of only 1.5 liters, then their predicted MVV, or ventilatory limit, can be calculated by multiplying their FEV1 of 1.5 liters times 40, which gives a maximum predicted minute ventilation of 60 liters. This particular patient stopped exercising at a maximum minute ventilation of 58 liters, which is 97% of predicted, so we can state that this patient did essentially reach their ventilatory mechanical limits. This calculation works for most lung disorders, whether obstructed or restricted. One has to be cautious using the calculated minute ventilation because in some conditions, such as myasthenia gravis, the FEV1 times 40 may be considerably higher than if the patient was asked to perform an MVV to calculate their predicted maximum minute ventilation. It's also important to examine the subject's patterns of ventilation, looking at their respiratory rate and the tidal volume response. Examining the tracings can be very useful. For example, 
Here we have a patient with severe COPD who demonstrates dynamic hyperinflation at a higher respiratory rates. Notice how the blue dots show the tidal volume increasing as exercise progresses, but then above anaerobic threshold, shown by the vertical line and green arrow, as the subject's acidosis progresses, eventually the respiratory rate, which is shown in red, increases to the point that the subject begins to demonstrate dynamic hyperinflation. The tidal volume starts to progressively fall as the patient breathes faster and faster. The pattern seen in restriction show the tidal volume cannot increase and remain relatively flat, while the respiratory rate rises extremely rapidly. Respiratory rates in the 50s or even higher are not unusual in interstitial lung diseases. Ventilatory mechanical limitations can occur in parenchymal lung diseases caused by obstruction or fibrotic or interstitial diseases. It can also occur as a result of diseases or deformities of the chest wall that limit the ability of the lung to expand, such as kyphoscoliosis. Neurologic diseases that impair the function of the muscles that control ventilation can also limit the mobility of the chest wall and diaphragm causing mechanical limitations. And as already discussed, the predicted value can be obtained by either measuring the maximum minute ventilation, or MVV, during spirometry, or estimating it by multiplying the FEV1 times 40. The second type of pulmonary limitation that can occur is what we will classify as gas exchange abnormalities. We look for gas exchange abnormalities by examining the changes in the ratio of the VE to VCO2 that occur throughout exercise. The terminology for this ratio is called the ventilatory equivalence for CO2. To understand the importance of this ratio, we need to go back to our basic respiratory physiology textbooks from medical school to find the formula for calculating minute ventilation, or VE, that is shown here. There you can also find the derivation of this formula, which is really not too difficult to understand. K is a constant that converts gases to body temperature and their fractional concentrations to partial pressures. Doing a little algebraic manipulation of this equation to get the VD to VT ratio to the left side of the equation, we are left with this formula. We can see that there is some kind of relationship of the VD to VT to the minute ventilation and VCO2 on the right side of the equation. And also notice that this ratio contains the same variables as the ventilatory equivalents for CO2 shown above that we are interested in studying, only they are inverted. Let's take a closer look at this equation. Based on this equation, as the VCO2 to VE ratio decreases, because we are subtracting it from 1, the VD to VT ratio increases. The key concept here is that since a decreasing VCO2 to VE ratio is just a reciprocal of the VE to VCO2 ratio, that means that a decreasing VCO2 to VE is just saying the same thing as an increasing VE to VCO2 ratio, which means that as the VE to VCO2 increases, the VD to VT ratio also increases. We also need to be aware that an excessive hyperventilatory response can increase the VE to VCO2 ratio when there is no abnormality of dead space ventilation. An arterial blood gas, PaCO2, can differentiate these two causes for the increased VEVCO2. Let's take a look at this equation again. In a steady state, if the subject's VCO2 remains constant, normally, as the VE increases, the PaCO2 should decrease by the same proportion. If the PaCO2 does not decrease proportionately, the VDVT ratio will increase. The VE to VCO2 ratio should be measured at anaerobic threshold or peak exercise when a subject is more likely to be breathing in response to their metabolic demands rather than having an increased ventilatory response from discomfort or anxiety. When the VE to VCO2 ratio is elevated, suggesting a gas exchange abnormality, this is a nonspecific finding and found in many different disease states. In addition to being caused by abnormalities of dead space ventilation of the lung parenchyma,
Just simply hyperventilating can increase this ratio, and arterial PCO2 is needed to exclude a true abnormality of dead space ventilation. Excessive ventilatory drive can be caused by underlying metabolic diseases or conditions that cause a metabolic acidosis. A clue to determine if hyperventilation is a contributing factor is if there is a decline in the PN tidal CO2 from rest to anaerobic threshold. This ratio is important for the cardiologist in the evaluation of morbidity and mortality in patients with cardiac failure, as well as prognostication for cardiac transplant. We will talk more about this in part two of our presentation. In pulmonary hypertension patients, this ratio can be excessively elevated. In addition to abnormalities in dead space ventilation, there appears to be additional mechanisms involved causing a hyperventilatory response to exercise. Because of this, in the later stages of pulmonary hypertension, this is one of the unique situations in which the P and tidal CO2 from rest to anaerobic threshold will decrease. Though the predicted values for VE to VCO2 increase with age, there's general agreement that at anaerobic threshold, it normally should be less than 35 and a peak exercise less than 40. Let's now move on to the third category of pulmonary limitations, which we will categorize as diffusion limitations. When we talk about diffusion limitations, we are referring to the physiologic definition of diffusion, which is the ability of O2 to passively exchange across the lung surface. We use oximetry to measure the O2 saturation and preferably ear or forehead over finger, especially when using a cyclic ergometer, because as exercise intensifies, subjects tend to want to grip the handlebars tighter and tighter. A decrease in O2 saturation of greater than or equal to 4% is usually considered a significant decline, but keep in mind, if the O2 sat does not fall below 90%, it is probably not a limiting factor. And it is not unusual to see drops of greater than or equal to 4% in fit elderly subjects. Another point to be made is that if a subject has a reduced anaerobic threshold, make sure to determine if the patient may have been hypoxic at that point to determine if that may or may not have been a contributing factor to the hypoxemia. We will discuss that further on part two of this presentation. As a quick review of how oxygenation is dependent on the lung's diffusing capacity, normally blood spends approximately three quarters of a second traveling through the pulmonary capillaries, and it is fully oxygenated in a quarter of a second. During exercise, when blood travels through the capillary in just a quarter of a second, that is still just enough time for it to become fully oxygenated. When there is thickening of the alveolar capillary membrane, such as occurs in an interstitial lung disease, as is shown here, the diffusion is slower. And in this example, when this subject is at rest, there's just enough time for the blood traveling the three quarters of a second through the capillary to become fully oxygenated. When this subject exercises and the blood is now traveling through the capillary in only a quarter of a second, we can see that there is not enough time for the blood to become fully oxygenated. And as we can see here, when the alveolar capillary membrane is severely thickened, there is not enough time, even at rest, for the blood to become fully oxygenated. To complete our analysis of the third type of pulmonary limitation that we categorize as diffusion abnormalities, these etiologies can be varied as well. Interstitial lung disease causes hypoxemia by thickening of the alveolar capillary membrane slowing the rate of transfer of oxygen into the RBC. Emphysema, on the other hand, causes impairment by destruction and loss of the actual alveolar capillary membrane. If there is no surface area present, there is nothing for oxygen to diffuse across. And that at high altitudes, because the rate of diffusion is dependent on the partial pressures of O2 in the atmosphere, if the PaO2 is much lower, the driving pressure for diffusion is also going to be much lower, slowing the rate of O2 uptake. The curves can appear similar to those we just examined for those who have interstitial lung disease. Regarding predicted values, an O2 saturation decline is usually not considered significant unless it falls by at least 4%, and it would need to fall below 90% to be considered causing an O2 deficit significant enough to be a limiting factor during exertion. To summarize what we have discussed, I am going to present a case study of a subject with only pulmonary limitations. This is a 60-year-old male with known severe COPD. His FEV1 on spirometry was only 1.2 liters. He was only able to achieve a peak VO2 of 60% of predicted maximum. 
and at that point of exercise, his maximum minute ventilation was 47 liters per minute. His VE to VCO2 ratio at anaerobic threshold was 43, and at peak exercise was 48. His O2 saturation fell from 95% at the start of exercise to 87% at anaerobic threshold and continued to fall to 84% at peak exercise. We determined that this subject achieved 98% of his predicted maximum minute ventilation. We calculated that by multiplying his FEV1 of 1.2 liters times 40 to obtain a maximum predicted minute ventilation of 48 liters. This indicates he reached a ventilatory mechanical limitation to exercise. His VE to VCO2 ratio was well over 35 at anaerobic threshold and above 40 at peak exercise, and in the absence of other findings such as heart disease, shows he probably had significant abnormalities of dead space ventilation. And by the fact his O2 sats fell progressively and were in the hypoxic range by the time he hit anaerobic threshold, there was also a severe diffusion limitation to exercise. In summary, we can state in this particular situation, this subject had a combination of ventilatory mechanical, gas exchange, and diffusion limitations to exercise.